We've got a really wonderful show coming up for you on American Black Journal. It is Black Music Month, and we're dedicating our entire show to music in the Black church. We'll talk about the roots of gospel and its evolution into the contemporary sounds of today. Plus, we'll examine the connection between the blues and gospel. And we'll look back at some gospel performances on this show over the year. Stay right there. American Black Journal starts right now. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by Nissan Foundation and viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. Today, we're continuing our series on the Black Church in Detroit, which is produced in partnership with the Ecumenical Theological Seminary and the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. In honor of Black Music Month, we're examining the roots of gospel in the Black Church and how it has uplifted African Americans for centuries. American Black Journal's A.J. Walker sat down with Dr. Brandon Waddles to talk about the history and evolution of gospel music. I will open up my heart to everyone I see. Can you talk to me about the connection between gospel and the Negro spiritual? Yes, absolutely. Gospel music, black gospel music, is an offset of the Negro spiritual. One of the main differences between the two is that we are not exactly aware of the composers of Wade in the Water or Joshua at the Battle of Jericho or Did My Lord Deliver Daniel. However, there are known composers of famous gospel songs like um, Oh Happy Day, or Edwin Hawkins or Total Praise, Richard Smallwood. Um, and so while there are certainly uh, similarities between the two, um, there are certainly differences between but both are um, certainly influential to the culture and the fabric of American music and America in general. I feel like another connection between gospel and the Negro spiritual is the way it uplifted people and kind of gave them hope because I feel like a lot of people, you know, you feel hopeful when you hear gospel music and Negro spirituals. Absolutely. The wow. Negro spiritual was so important to these enslaved Africans who, as scripture would foretell, um, were brought into the strange land, having been asked to sing a new song. We understand that many of these enslaved Africans came to the Americas um, with different dialects, different languages that they spoke. Music has always been a universal language, and coded therein within these songs were messages, not only messages of hope, but messages that would lead these enslaved Africans to freedom, follow the drinking gourd, they were following the constellation. Uh, Deep River, my home is over Jordan. Jordan River, scripturally, is of course referring to, in their context, the Mississippi. It was their way to freedom. If you think about jazz, and blues, and certainly black gospel music. Songs like Precious Lord, written by the father of gospel music, Thomas Dorsey, were written to express the, uh, the despair um, and the tragedy of having lost not only his wife and his child in a car accident, but it certainly expressed the hope of a savior um, that would lead him through uh, those troubling times. Precious Lord, Take my hand, lead me on, 
let me stand. I am tired. And so both of those genres, these uh, truly black American genres, speak to both the reality of the situation, but also the hope of, uh, of a present future. I know I've heard people say in the past that the music today is not the same. And it just is not as emotional as it has been, you know, in times past. And when I think about a lot of the R&B artists today, not all of them come from a gospel background. So when you compare to rhythm and blues singers of past, most of them had their roots in the church. Mm -hmm. Aretha Franklin, Sam Cooke, Otis Redding, those people. And then today, people are, they just say it doesn't feel the same. So many of the legendary R&B and soul singers that you named, like Aretha Franklin, James Brown, Ray Charles, Anita Baker, and all of those, not only were they influenced by the sounds of gospel, but they were influenced by the preaching of the gospel too. Aretha Franklin talks about how her father, the very uh, legendary Reverend C.L. Franklin, influenced the way that she sang by virtue of the way that he preached. I believe that they have taken away my law. I believe the world is concerned about that. And so the cadence in his hoop, you know, and I, you know influenced her soul efforts and her vocalism. James Brown talks about the way that he moved across the stage. And we talk about James Brown as the godfather of soul and certainly influencing um, the, dance, uh, the dancing of Michael Jackson and Chris Brown. He learned those by just sitting around in church and watching the pastor move across the pulpit as the, they were getting to the height of their sermon. And so if there's anything missing, it's not even so much um, them missing the sounds of the gospel singing, they're just missing the entire lived experience of the communion, the theatricality sometimes, the performative aspects of black church. There's nothing like black church folks getting together on a Sunday. All of these genres from the blues to uh, gospel to jazz are still heavily, heavily utilizing elements um, of the Negro spiritual, which of course are connected to African culture and tradition. The idea of the storyteller, the griot um, in African American culture, this idea of community engagement within music, the idea that music is going to be um, part of almost every great life event. And that happens with gospel, it happens with jazz, it happens with rhythm and blues, um, it happens later with rock and roll, uh, happens, of course, with hip hop and rap. Um, and I know that we try and steer clear of trying to make connections between the two, but there is no hip hop and rap um, without the Negro spiritual, without the storyteller, without the call and response. Um, there are certainly elements of hip hop and R&B that have, um, hip hop and rap and R&B that have found their way into gospel. The blues are about pain and sadness. And gospel is about healing and hope. Now, despite these differences, the two genres share some of the same roots, some of the same influences and musical traits. I spoke with Reverend Robert Jones Sr., who is also a blues musician, about the connection between the blues and gospel. I, I'm one of the people who listens to popular music all the time uh, and delights in the idea that in so many songs written by so many artists, I can hear the church, right? I can hear gospel music in Prince. I could hear it, of course, in Aretha. Uh, I can hear it in Demi Lovato or Chance the Rapper. Uh, right. it, it really is part of American music, this, this, uh, this history of gospel. Uh, but but nowhere do you hear it more, of course, than in the blues. And the, the, the connection right. between those two is really something special. Right. Well, absolutely, Stephen. I mean, when you think about American music, if you were to come up with a metaphor of a tree, uh, that all of these different styles that you just mentioned are the branches, and the trunk is the blues, but even deeper in the in the ground would be the roots yeah. and the roots that's the spiritual yeah. 
So not only do you, because you can hear, you know, you can hear it in Debbie Lovato or you can hear it in, you know, just name whoever, uh, because it's all sort of rooted in the black spiritual and then comes up through the blues and branches out through everything else. Yeah, yeah. So as a uh, reverend and uh, a musician, uh, talk about how you how you navigate those connections and how they kind of spill over, I guess, from one line of work uh, into the other. Well, I was, I was really blessed. I'm a native Detroiter, but I was blessed to have this grandmother from Southern Alabama, from Connecticut County, Alabama, who loved many, many kinds of music. So aside from going to and growing up in the black church, uh, she had no problem with putting some Muddy Waters or Lightning Hopkins or B.B. King on the Magnavox and, inter- and, and you know, and entertaining the entire block. <laughs> so um, I grew up with like both of those influences. And I really feel fortunate that if I had just been a church kid, I may not have been able to make the connection with the blues. And if I had just been sort of a kid who listened to nothing but blues, I, I probably wouldn't hear that but being this hybrid kid um, allows me to view both of those kind of musics in a sense without prejudice if that makes sense Mm -hmm. so i can see the connections and i've really been blessed by the connections between both the sacred and the secular yeah so so uh you know uh, the blues is about uh, people expressing pain and and sadness through music and and gospel is usually about healing and 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 hope. Those two things would seem to be at odds in in some ways. I've always felt like uh, though there is a connection between the messages as well as the music itself. Definitely, something happens with the spiritual, uh, which is the music that came out of slavery, which was heavy, which was about you know uh, getting heaven when you die mm-hmm. or suffering or, or or you know being resilient and enduring and then the blues was kind of like about the idea of not suffering on a plantation but hopping a train <laughs> and getting away from from all of that stuff and then in like around 1930 they melded into this music called gospel mm-hmm. you had these sort of blues musicians who were looking at how the vitality was slipping out of sacred music and they combined the blues with the sacred and that produced gospel which you rightly identified as being joyous music right it's 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 the good news but there is no joy without some pain right Uh, weeping endures for night but joy comes in the morning so you have both of those elements mixed in And I think the sacred and the secular really grew up right next to each other. Hmm. And if you, if, if your socialization was to steady, you know, be steady to raise a family, to endure the hardships that you were given, you know, folks pushed you toward the sacred. But if your inclination was, I'm going to, you know, escape from this, situation I'm in and I'm going to enjoy some life while I'm here, your inclination was toward the the blues. But strangely enough, they always have this symbiotic relationship. The greatest gospel singers tend to come out of the blues and the greatest instrumentalists come out, or is that the other way around? The greatest instrumentalists come out of the blues, the greatest singers come out of the church. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, if you think about both gospel and blues, uh, you know they've they've had time periods where they were more popular um, than they are right now, and I guess some people might say that they are becoming more and more lost art forms, uh, especially as you know people leave the church or don't don't react or interact with the church the same way they used to. Um, and and blues is not as prevalent on the airwaves or anywhere as it used right. to be. But uh, how, how do you feel about that? I think these are foundational forms, and they keep reinventing themselves. They they find a way to push through because they don't go away. I mean, chances are, if you're a young singer, the first place that somebody told you that you could sing was in church. Was church, right? Yeah. 
Right. So, so I was having a conversation with a young lady the other day at, at the Henry Ford Museum, and she was amazed that the new Elvis movie, mm-hmm. which of course has to feature a lot of blues, mm-hmm. uh, has a cover of a tune done by Big Mama Thornton called Ain't Nothing But a Hound Dog, mm-hmm. but it is redefined by Doja Cat. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it just, it doesn't go away. Right. It just sort of morphs into something else. And the difficulty is sometimes finding the strand, you know, finding why Ludacris has Lead Belly's Pick a Bale of Cotton <laughs> in a song called Rosa Parks. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, how does that work? That's right. <laughs> Um, I also want to talk about the fact that th- that these are um, these are uniquely African American art forms, um, and and they they remind us, I think, when just when you were talking about the modern influences that we see for them, they're a reminder of how much, if not all, of American music really owes its existence and and finds its roots in. The African American experience, and therefore in uh, African American music. Definitely, you know, one of the things that I think we don't necessarily appreciate at first listening is that this music went far beyond entertainment. It was music that allowed you to work in rhythm. It was music that conveyed life messages uh, of of just you know wisdom uh, of how men and women interact with one another it was poetry and you know it 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 carried a technology of work i think the one of the reasons that african americans were as resilient as they were in a system like slavery was they learned how to make the music keep their bodies moving how mm-hmm. to put their mind somewhere else uh, in spite of of the backbreaking labor that they were dealing with, right? Those are functions that come from African music, translated through American experience, and we don't really think about it very much until we find ourselves using it. Yeah. So that when you have a time of crisis, uh, I remember during nine eleven, folks were um, singing spirituals. They were singing, you know. They were singing, we shall overcome, we are not afraid, all those kind of things, because it's useful. And when the use, you know, when 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 it you you find that not only is it beautiful and it's resilient, but it's useful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it comes back when you need it. Um, and then there is the idea too, I think, of no matter what the error. When you hear that voice that carries the African American singing aesthetic, um, when you hear Fantasia Barino, <laughs> you instantly know that's a church girl. I don't yeah. care what she's singing, right? <laughs> she's got she she got the sanctified church right there with her. She kicks off her shoes. She 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 lets you know she lets the spirit have its way. Mm-hmm. And there is an an experience in in the black church called singing yourself happy, mm-hmm. right? So, at a certain point, not only does the music serve as entertainment, but it also can serve to sing yourself happy yeah. when you when you need that technology. We have had several gospel performances on this show since it began airing on Detroit Public Television in 1968. So we thought it would be a good time to reach back into the archives and take a look at a few of those special appearances. Here they are.
and say what you want and do what you will but I ain't gonna let it get me down no the road is rough and the mountains get hard to climb sometimes but I ain't no no ain't gonna let it get me down no Uh, can't you see that I'm, uh, I'm a little too strong? This is why I can't go wrong. If I hold on, hold on. That's going to do it for us. Thanks for watching. You can see all of the Black Church in Detroit episodes and learn more about our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org. And you can always connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. Take care and we'll see you next time. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. 
The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by Nissan Foundation and viewers like you. Thank you.